Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have you here with us. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to come online and uh, pray and uh, read a psalm together today. Uh, so let's just begin with prayer today. Father, I just uh, thank you for today, and I thank you for those who have uh, joined me today. Um, thank you for your presence with us, Lord, that you never forsake us nor uh, leave us, Lord. I thank you that your presence surrounds us, Lord. I thank you that you are here with us now, that you have made us the Holy of Holies, that you have made us a temple of the living God, being built up and strengthened in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, once again, I pray that you would fill all of us, both those listening and those who are uh, listening later, with an extraordinary measure of your Holy Spirit. I'm mindful that apart from you, we can do nothing. I can do nothing. And so, Father, what you have brought to mind today to pray for is all of those essential workers across uh, the nation who are going out to their jobs because certain jobs have to take place. And I just pray that you'd protect them. Uh, my sister is one of them. I know we have people in our church who are essential workers and going to work every day. Uh, my daughter, Sarah, a nurse. Uh, Father, there's others as well. And so we just pray that you would be a shield about them, that you would protect them, that you would keep them from uh, getting the illness, from getting this virus. I pray for uh, the essential workers in all the different fields, Lord, uh, from grocery stores to uh, plumbers and electricians who are still working to keep our houses running, uh, government officials and government workers who are um, doing all sorts of work to keep uh, the government running and all, all the soldiers on duty. And Father, there are uh, all the nurses and doctors and CNAs and the janitors uh, in the hospitals. So many people still going out to work while the rest of us stay home to protect our loved ones and to protect each other and to protect the elderly amongst us, Lord. I pray that you would give us great wisdom in knowing when to stay home and know when to venture out for those absolute necessities, Lord. I also pray for the non-essential workers, Lord, who are staying home, who are in danger of losing jobs or have already been laid off. <clears throat> Father, this is a very difficult time. None of us on the planet have ever faced a time like this, where the economies of the world are being completely disrupted, where our lives are being disruptive, being disrupted, where it's even a cause of concern just to go to the grocery store. And so, Father, I pray that you would meet all of our needs. That you would meet the needs of those who have been laid off. That you would meet the needs of those who have already lost their jobs. I pray for those amongst us who are uh, people who are on low income, Lord either on SSI or retirement or Social Security or what have you. This is a hard time uh, as well for them when their dollars were already stretched. And so, Father, we just pray that you would bless them. And, um, and Father, where the rest of us can uh, help, I pray that we would uh, be able to help, Lord. Father, I just thank you for what you are doing in us and through us in this time that you are strengthening your body, that you are strengthening our faith, that you are strengthening our love for the world, that you are strengthening our love for each other. And this comes all by your hand. And Father, lastly, I pray for those who amid this crisis uh, don't know you. And so their only hope is in science and in doctors and epidemiologists and those who are making the decisions politically. I pray that you would unblind them, 
that you would uh, stop the attack of the enemy on their life. That you would bind the enemy from blinding them, Lord. So that they may see with clarity this incredible gospel that you've entrusted us with. This gospel of grace, this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This gospel that beckons that anyone who would call out to you, save me, Jesus. Understanding that you are, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is deity in the flesh, that he is God. And that he is the Messiah, the one who came and died for our sins that we might be forgiven. Was raised to, to life that we might be saved. Uh, ascended into heaven and presented his blood in the real Holy of Holies so that the gift of the Holy Spirit might be sent to us. Father, we exult that Christ is the one who dwells in us, and we are full of the Holy Spirit. Even to, we are filled to the fullness of God. Thank you that we have become uh, the temple, Lord. And I pray through this time that you would be uh, adding living stones, living bricks to your temple as people turn to you and find hope in you find justification in you, find redemption in you, find peace in you, and find that your extravagant grace is enough, that your extravagant grace is sufficient for us. Father, we entrust our world, our nation, our state, our counties, our very lives, we entrust them into your kind and merciful hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to be reading Psalm 5. I'm just going in order. Psalm 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And uh, this is a uh, different psalm. It's not a psalm of David. Some, some have attributed it to David, but it's not. And so we're going to begin reading it, and then I will come back and uh, uh, reflect on it. So Psalm uh, 5, verses 1 through 12. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, no evil dwells with you. The, bo both, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow down in reverence for you. O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with the tongue, with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy, and may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as a shield. So in this um, psalm, there is an interesting structure. It's called a chiasm. It's something that was discovered by Rowan Nils Lund in the Covenant uh, back in the, about 1910, 1905. I don't know exactly when he discovered it. But it's a um, structure that they used in oral, oral cultures, um, 
we don't have the when you are reading you can read something and then if you didn't get it you can go back and read it again well oral cultures when somebody was speaking you couldn't do that so sometimes they would say something going in hit the center and then turn around and say the same thing in different words coming back out so i looked up wikipedia to get, get a definition this is a good definition it's in rhetoric meaning uh spoken or, or written words uh, chiasmus or less commonly chiasm is reversal of grammatical structures in successive phrases or clauses but with no repetition of words so in this psalm it's divided up into a chiasm uh, you begin with uh, uh, a1 and then you go to b1 and then the center of the psalm is c1 or and c2 and that's the center point the the thing that's wanting to be enforced or made how do how do i say it emphasized in the psalm is that center portion then you go back out uh, to b2 and to a2 uh, and so it's going in and coming back out uh, and so we begin with uh, psalm 5 1 through 3 um, a cry to yahweh and again we we read give ears to my words o lord as i've said many times you see the lord there capitalized which means that's the name yahweh I won't go into the whole exp explanation of that, but it's also we know that, it, that that's Jesus. He comes along and says, I am the good shepherd. Before Abraham was born, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the resurrection and the life and so on. Jesus was uh, proclaiming himself to be Yahweh. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. So whatever this psalmist is going through, he's again in a difficult place. And we know that it has to do with uh, those evil people out there who were uh, causing some distress to him. So give ear to my words, O Lord. What a wonderful prayer for us right now. Yahweh, Jesus, give ear uh, to my words. Give ear to our words as we cry out to you in the midst of this pandemic pandemic consider our groanings heed the sound of my cry for help lord heed the sound of our cry for help my king and my god and my king would is is the idea that yahweh is the king jesus is the king and he rules and so what we're asking is uh, heed the sounds of my cry for help to the ruler of all creation to the re ruler of the entire universe and my god that personal, my God. For to you I pray, so we pray to, to Yahweh. In the morning, O Lord, in the morning, Yahweh, you will hear my voice. Um, I love that. In the morning when I, when I take a shower is, is usually when I'm uh, awake sufficiently enough to uh, turn to the Lord and say good morning and, and uh, focus on him and ask him to fill my life with the Holy Spirit. Um, in the morning, O oh Lord, you will hear my voice. And notice he doesn't say you might hear my voice, you may hear my voice, but you hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. So I, I will order my prayer. I will line up my prayer request to you or my conversation with you uh, better. And then I will eagerly watch for your response. And so that's the, the beginning, the A1 of the chiasm. And so then we go into B1 of the chiasm, and this is uh, a judgment. It's, it's very uh, uh, stark, if you will. Uh, let's read it. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. That word wickedness is a word that means to break the law, to, break, to be a criminal. Not just God's law, but the laws of the land. So for you, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in those who are criminal in their actions. No evil dwells with you. Another version says, uh, no evil, or you cannot uh, uh, dwell in the presence of evil. Uh, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Iniquity is that group sin again, that family sin, uh, that is corporate sin, if you will, that gets passed down from generation to, to generation. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. I start getting nervous here in these words, because first of all, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. That's true. No evil dwells with you. Um, the psalmist had a, how do I say it? A limited understanding of God's character at this point. They had the law. They had the revelation of God in um, Exodus 34, where he says the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, 
and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And it goes on by saying, but by no means does he leave the guilty unpunished, punishing the guilty uh, even to the third and fourth generations and so on. So you have this kind of, of contrast in God's character between his compassion, his covenant love, his long-suffering love, and then his just, justice and his judgment. And I read this and I go, hmm, Jesus, he was accused of hanging out with sinners. In, in Luke 15, the Pharisees and scribes were uh, very angry at Jesus because he hung out with tax collectors and the sinners, the prostitutes, their bodyguards, the goons, if you will. Um, and everywhere we see Jesus go as Yahweh embodied in the flesh, as Yahweh showing up on the planet in the mystery of the Trinity, we see him approaching sinners with love and grace and acceptance and forgiveness giving them the offer of eternal life, but for the believing. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. You destroy those who lie. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. You destroy those who speak falsehood, who lie. You, the Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. I think of the, the men on the cross, uh, the thieves on the cross. One of them is hurting, hurling abuse at Jesus in Matthew. We're told that both of them were hurling abuse at Jesus and, and skepticism and so on. And then somewhere along the line, the one thief has a change of mind. He has, a, in a sense, a repentance of his mind. He's being convinced, persuaded by what he sees in Jesus, that Jesus is who he says he is. And so he says, um, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And those most wonderful and poignant words, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. That man was a violent man. He was a zealot, which means he was probably uh, involved in a violent uh, attempt to overthrow the Roman government and therefore was being destroyed. Um, you destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. What I find is that the same Lord who this is true of also has such a love and such a grace and such compassion for people that he would take all of the world's sin, all of the world's iniquity, all of our group sin and individual sin, all of our lying, all of our violence, all of our pride, all of our criminal acts and our uh, breaking the law. And he takes it in his own body, allows himself to be nailed to the cross. And at the last moment, cries out with a loud voice, it is finished, and then bows his head and gives up his spirit that we might be forgiven, that we might live that we might live with him forever. So we move on in the chiasm, and we, we see that judgment, which we, we see borne out in Jesus' a body. And then we come to uh, Psalm 5-7, which is the worship of Yahweh. And we read 5-7, But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, that's that covenant love, that He's in covenant. The nation of Israel is in covenant with God. He has bound himself by the blood of animals to even keep this covenant even to death. It's that long-suffering love that never gives up. By your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your holy temple, I will bow down in reverence for you. So we know that this is in the Psalm of David because the temple wasn't built yet. It was built by Solomon, the king uh, David's son. And so he says, by this covenant love, I will enter your house. Here's the rub. By the covenant love of Jesus and the Father who made a covenant together on the cross in the sacrifice of Jesus, in his spilt blood, he was cutting a covenant by offering up his body. Get this. We don't enter his house. We don't uh, enter his holy uh, temple at your holy temple where you couldn't even go into the holy place, much less the holy of holies. Now, we have become his house. 
We have become the residents of God. We have become his holy temple, being built up, a spiritual priesthood, a spiritual temple, built, built up with living stones. And I will bow down in reverence for you. That word reverence is that word fear. It's that reverential fear. When you're coming over from uh, Eastern Washington, uh, over, I think it's, I don't remember the pass. Is it Chinook Pass? It's the one that goes over by Morton. And you, you're coming around towards, uh, no, it's Packwood, as you're coming around towards Packwood. And you come around one corner, and you haven't been able to see Mount Rainier the whole time. And suddenly there's Mount Rainier right in front of you. And it's this incredible uh, awe-inspiring view, and you just kind of go, wow, look at how beautiful that is. In the same way, when we understand who Yahweh is, who Jesus is, who the Father is, who the Holy Spirit is in the Trinity, and that we are the temple of God, that, they, that the Trinity has come, that God has come to live within us, I bow down in this awestruck reverence for, for God, for Yahweh. Then we get back to the chiasm, and the C2 is verse 8, request for righteousness. And so we go back to that same verse, that same screen. O oh Lord, lead me in your righteousness, righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. So here we see that the psalmist has these foes, these evil men, these workers of wickedness. O oh Lord, Yahweh, lead me in your righteousness. Here, here the psalmist, he isn't saying, lead me in my righteousness. He already knows that in of himself, he isn't righteous. And of, in of ourselves, we can never attain to righteousness, either a right standing with God or that, that right relationship with God, nor the right behavior before God. Uh, we can't produce it. We never were meant to. He is God. He produces righteousness in us. Uh, having a righteousness um, not based on the law, or our own effort, but the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. O oh Lord, lead me in righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight for me. Make your way straight before me. What a wonderful thing to ask right now, to make God's way, Yahweh's way, straight for us through this pandemic. That's a good prayer. Lord, even now I pray that you would make each one of our paths straight through this pandemic, and that you would bring us through to the other side. And so there you have the center of the chiasm, uh, worship, that worship of God, and then the request for leading us in righteousness, for keeping me in that path of righteousness. I'm reminded of Psalm 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's the same idea, O oh Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. And then we come to backing out of this uh, center, if you will, to B2, Psalm uh, 5, verses 9 and 10. And so we read these words. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction it's, it, itself. Uh, I can't help but think of a lot of the reports we're hearing on the, the news and on the internet today. I've had uh, several people send me uh, memes or videos or uh, such things, uh, news reports, and then I fact-checked them and find, found out that they're completely erroneous. I don't know why people do this, uh, creating all this false information out there. A lot of it is fear-mongering. The news also, I read an uh, article in the Atlantic last night that was, uh, I came away just uh, full of fear, and I had to turn to the Lord and say, okay, calm my fears, um, you know why they do that? Because it sells papers, it sells news time, it sells stories. Uh, they're not about telling us truth, they're about making money. And it, it's uh, incredulous to me, unbelievable that they're doing this. And I think it's also unconscionable that they're doing this, that they're uh, stirring up uh, fear and anxiety as a means of uh, gaining funds. There's nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God. Here's that judgment. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. 
meaning the consequences of their own actions will bring them uh, to fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, cast them out, for they are rebellious against you. And again, I come back as with that first part of judgment, that B1, and I look at B2 and I go, well, I've been rebellious. And guess what? All of you have been rebellious too in one form or another, whether rebellious in your pride, in your grumbling and complaining, in your self-righteousness, or rebellious in your uh, sins of the flesh, if you will. And so I, I read those words, their throat is an open grave, they flatter with their tongue. That's quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 3. And so now we, we go to the New Testament, looking back at this psalm through the eyes of Paul, uh, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we see. So we're looking at the chiasm of judgment and judgment, both of them. And this is what we see. Romans 3, verses 10 through 18. I quoted it, I, I use the NIV here because this is the, the version I quoted these verses or memorized these verses from. I've kind of lost track of them now, but I need to uh, renew my work in uh, getting these back in my mind. It's a wonderful text if you understand what it's saying. It says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Do you hear that? There is no one righteous, not even one. So the psalmist is saying, lead me in the path of righteousness, but cast out the evil one. Along comes Paul, and these are all quotations from the law, from the, from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scriptures, but specifically the law, the, the five books of Moses. There was no one righteous, not even one, save Jesus Christ. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God, meaning no one in of ourselves who, who would seek God. All have turned away. They have, and I would like to say we have, together become worthless in of ourselves. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do you notice that? It starts with not even one, ends with not even one. Let me read these words again to imprint them in, in your uh, thinking here. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who, who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And then we have the quotation uh, from Psalm 5. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their, their, their lips. We could uh, reword this, if you will, because he's quoting from the law directly and from the Psalms. We could say, our throats are open graves in of ourselves prior to Christ. Our tongues have practiced deceit. The poison of vipers has been on our lips their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our mouths have been full of cursing and bitterness. Their, sweet are, their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In, in the center of the psalm, what was it? He was having that fear, that reverential worship of God. Here, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is these uh, verses from verse 10 through verse 18, describe the whole human race apart from Christ. It described us apart from Christ. And our only hope is this, this extravagant grace of Jesus, which offers this free gift of eternal life, this free gift of abundant life, of living in that incredible, uh, boundless love of God every day. Uh, we don't just get saved for the future. We get saved for now, for this ever eternal moment that is passing, that I might and you might live this abundant life now by our surrendering to, to the Holy Spirit. Uh, so if we go back to, there's nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O Lord. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious, rebellious against you. I can't help but think of Romans 3.20, just two verses after the verses we just read. It says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. And then we have Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, therefore, having been justified by our trust in God, we have peace with God. 
we have peace with God. That's a continuous uh, state of peace that we live in now through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have obtained access into this grace in which we now stand. Where is your standing? Where is my standing? Not in our self-effort, not in our ability, not in our goodness, not in our own righteousness. Our standing is in the extravagant grace of God, in what he did for us in the cross, in what he did for us in and through the resurrection, in what he did for us in the ascension and, and the giving of the Spirit, and what he, he is yet doing for us by the power of his grace, and what he will yet do for us uh, in the coming days. There is also future grace. Uh, it says in Ephesians 2, 7 that, uh, for in the ages to come, he will show the riches of the glory of his kindness, the kindness of his grace to us in Christ Jesus. In the eons to come, in the eternities to come, he will be showing the kindness of his grace to us in Christ Jesus. Uh, so we are justified not by our, our own actions, but by the shed blood of Christ and by our coming to him and offering our lives, believing uh, those words that he said about his son. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then it goes on in the last verses. We come to the chiasm again and we have A1, B1, C1, C2, B2. And now A2 is Psalm 5 verses 11 and 12. A call to take refuge in Yahweh. A call to take refuge in Yahweh. So we get to those words and it says, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. So in the midst of this pandemic, where are you going to take refuge? In your own ability? In your own strength? Or are you going to take refuge in Yahweh? Out of that, there is gladness of heart. There is joy. Let them ever sing for joy. But let them all who take refuge in you be glad. In you be glad. So we take refuge in him, not just for the pandemic. We take refuge in him uh, over and against our sin, over against the coming death that all of us will experience, over against the wiles of the, of the devil, uh, of Satan and his cohorts, over and against the, the curse of sin, which with its consequences. But let all who take refuge Refuge in, in you, Lord, be glad. Notice now he's praying directly to the Father. Let them ever sing for joy, and may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exalt in you, that those who love your name may exalt in you. And it says, let them ever sing for joy, and may you shelter them, uh, that those who love your name may exalt in you. I'm sorry, I have a distraction right now, so... Um, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy, and may you shelter them. Uh, when we take refuge in, in God, we find a great joy in him. Uh, may he shelter us. What poignant words for today, that he may shelter us. Uh, that those who love your name may exalt in you. Do you love the name of Jesus, the name of Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God? Do you love the name of Jesus? Well, we love because he first loved us. We love because we have come and uh, soaked ourselves in the love of God. Or better yet, he has soaked us in the love of God. And in return, we, we love him in return. For it is you who bless, for it is you who blesses the righteous man. O Lord, you surround him, you surround her with favor as with a shield. That word favor there is akin to grace. You surround us with favor, with grace, as with a shield. Who are the righteous? Those who, are, who have entrusted their life to Christ, period. What is a good Christian? Those who have been washed in the blood of Christ, who seek to live uh, by, daily by surrendering ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to his work in our life. So there you have... The whole psalm, uh, that those last two verses um, and the first three verses uh, are marvelous calls, cries out to God's help and cries for his, um, that we take refuge in him, that he would be our shield. His grace would be our shield. Uh, so take a look at this uh, afterwards 
if you have time today, take a look. Uh, focus on the going in, the coming out, and those center two verses, verses 7 eight, and 8. Let them speak to your soul. We worship God, and we respond by asking him to lead us in the path of righteousness. So uh, we'll be coming back tomorrow with uh, Psalm 6. Also, this Sunday, we're having Communion Sunday, so if you'll be joining us, uh, prepare uh, any beverage you have uh, in your house and any kind of bread, crackers, uh, whatever you have, uh, bread, crackers, uh, even uh, Ritz Bits, whatever you have, it doesn't matter. We'll be celebrating Communion, so have that prepared ahead of time. So that's it for today. I hope to see you tomorrow at 11.55 for the countdown and then 12 noon for a reading of Psalm 6 and again, praying for our nation and world. Again, we'll close with the blessing from Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace.